Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. We've got a very special episode today. It's the debut of our monthly NFT update with our friend DCL Blogger. So Maddie returns. Welcome back, Maddie. <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, thanks for having me again, Alex. I guess since we last spoke, um, well, for those that don't know, Maddie's heavily involved in the community of Decentraland. That project has really come on in leaps and bounds in terms of awareness, as well as the, the token price for those of you that were investors. But it's more about the NFT space and the awareness that has just gone gangbusters lately. And I guess we've been hoping that it would happen. Probably you more so than me, it's your focus. Um, at the start of the year, I thought that NFTs and gaming would be one area that catches on, but it has gone bonkers in the past couple of weeks so people have got a lot of questions we're going to dive into all of that and just like we do in our other monthly series we're going to try and keep you up to date with everything that's happening because it is a frantic world so maddie maybe just from your point of view before we get into anything specific what's changed in the past uh few months to, to cause this uh, to cause this i think this, I, I was sitting back and thinking exactly what's going on here and we're seeing a lot of awareness and a lot of people speaking about NFTs and, and Twitter's kind of blown up, YouTube's blown up, everyone wants to know what's going on. But the prices aren't as astronomical as they used to be. In, I mean, they're not that different than they used to be, sorry. We still had $50,000 sales for NFTs or $100,000 sales. Some lands for Decentraland went for a couple hundred thousand dollars. But now people are paying attention because it's not just land, it's art. There's multiple assets now selling for six figures. And I think what's happened now is that there's a lot of people like DeFi has kind of gone exponential. And over the last two months, there's so many more people now that know how to use MetaMask and kind of go through that decentralized process where they're not, they don't have money sitting on an exchange, but they want to park it where they can that makes money back for them. Mm. And if you look at it, July, August, July and August, we've seen like a massive exponential growth in DeFi. Surprise, surprise. NFTs have seen, seen like the same growth, right? Mm. at least in attention. So I think there's a correlation there where suddenly the bridging gap of people not knowing what the hell MetaMask is before now is not a problem for and, and the niche has grown a bit more. So I think those two things are, are the biggest kind of catalysts. Mm. And there's a lot of points I want to dive into today because there's already people at home that are saying, you know, what is an NFT? Why can't I just screenshot it? Why are people paying thousands of dollars for land? Now, if you... Take a step back and open up your mind. A lot of those arguments are what the like no coiners say about Bitcoin. Why are people paying money for a, for a coin mm -hmm. and those types of things? So we'll get into it because there's more nuances than just that. But you raised some interesting points when we were speaking the other night, Matty, about the flow of money and the fact that there's people that have made a lot of money now in um, DeFi and other projects. And rather than just going into stable coins, they're sort of saying, well, what can I diversify into? And I don't know if you saw this tweet that... Um, uh, Shamath put out, the famous investor who's on CNBC and all them, and he said people are diversifying and it's no longer stocks and bonds and those things that we talk about that are kind of overvalued or no longer mm -hmm. offer that diversification. And he literally said collectibles, um, artwork, all those types of things, and that is exactly what crypto investors are doing as well. So I found that fascinating. I hadn't thought about it from that mm -hmm. point of view before, but is that something you've actually seen with all your tight-knit friends and that? Yeah, definitely, man. I, I think, I don't know about my friends in real in the real world or in real life, but for the NFT community, it's been about where can you park your money to see stable growth? And that's the most interesting thing is about art. And I think that's what people do when they become millionaires and billionaires is they diversify their assets and they protect them by putting them into these more likely to appreciate assets and art and, you know, historical, like, you know, cars. That's why people have big car collections and these things that, historically only become more scarce in time. And now, um, where do crypto people park their money? Rarely are they going to pull their money out of Bitcoin and put it into some fiat assets. We've got houses, we've got traditional physical mm. um, assets. But what about on-chain assets? And I think NFTs is going to be that class where hopefully it's going to have that um, spotlight on it when Bitcoin hits six figures or seven figures, if it ever does, then, hey, you know, you can park your money in these NFT assets when when you can buy a lot of them with a stronger buy power now with Ethereum and Bitcoin going crazy. And that was my um, whole kind of thesis when going into NFTs. I was like, it's my hedge that I don't hold much Bitcoin. That's probably my bad. I should probably hold much Bitcoin. But if I miss the boat, then hopefully if Bitcoin moves, that money will move to the NFT space. 
Mm. Uh, I think it's you know it's that's it's what people do in the real world with their money once they made their millions, and I'm hoping it'll it'll happen to the NFT space. Yeah, it's so funny. Did you remember a project called Bitcar like three years ago? Bitcar, no man, they, I, they, I don't. They were basically doing um, tokenized cars, and the the concept behind it I didn't realize. And you look at the chart of the the growth of like high end luxury and collectible cars. And it grows pretty consistently, like 10, 15% year over year, like more than the stock market. Just as you said, it's kind of like a rich man's ETF. They use vehicles. And mm. I'd never thought about it like that. So they have fractional ownership. And I just think like that project failed, but I think they were almost ahead of their time because now mm. literally people are talking about tokenizing NFTs and, and cars is one of those things that has come up. So interesting for this thing to go full circle. And when we start to speak about all this, I guess or any any concept that we cover, the way to know that you're ahead of the curve is when there's a small group of smart guys, um, like Maddie was one of the people that I follow and they're talking about it and they're passionate um, and the community is very small, but then other people start to talk about it and you can see that there's something exciting happening and then it gets mm. more attention on Twitter and then some of the YouTubers start talking about it and then some of the funds and newsletters start talking about it and literally in this past week, we've seen uh, Delphi Digital start to cover this space uh, Mazari, who's probably the most well-known crypto researchers, um, I think it was Delphi that bought $150,000 worth of the Axie Infinity, which was one of those projects mm -hmm. I said best projects in NFTs to keep an eye nice. on. So it is just mm -hmm. amazing to watch this unfold. And it's kind of happening faster than I thought. Like DeFi took crypto winter and you could argue one or two years to catch on. But mm -hmm. I think the attention is really there now. So it's just a matter of, well, is it ready for the people? It can Decentraland ha handle thousands of people mm -hmm. yet? What are your sort of answers to those types of things? Yeah, well, that's I think what's happened as well is the timing has been perfect. Is that two years ago, three years ago, um, you know, NFTs did exist, but they didn't really have much utility. Decentraland was a very much just a plan on paper. Um, what's it called? Uh, um, Axie Infinity was just a plan that looked really nice on the website. Now, two years down the track, Axie Infinity have a buzzing user base that every month, um, you know, fight for a prize in their tournaments. They have multiple people that collaborate with them running tournaments. People are hooked on that game like you wouldn't imagine. Assets have gone up from like $1,000 to $50,000. So um, I think now you're seeing the user base growth kind of being that base structure of value to these projects as opposed to before it was just kind of a hope and a dream that they're going to fulfill their promises. Now there's platforms that are out there. Decentraland as well, as well is out there. So much stabilization work still needs to be done, though. Um, you can probably handle like two to 300 people in the same realm. But, you know, once you get to thousands, it'll struggle. So we're still going through that stabilization process. But there are, there are maybe a handful of projects that have an alpha or some sort of product out there to experience. And I think they're the ones that are going to do well because I know and I've experienced this, is it took these projects one to two years of blood, sweat, and tears, fighting out bear periods, um, waves of people showing interest and then disappearing to actually come out with a product, still be well-funded, and have a very promising horizon ahead of them that are now lasting. And if I if some new product gets pitched to me, in my head it's straight away like, well, how long is it going to take for you to put a product out? And mm. who's going to be way ahead of you till you put your product out? Yeah, without uh, picking on any projects, there's been a few that have come out that are in the sort of virtual world space. Um, have they put in those two years of blood, sweat and tears? And from what I've seen that they, they kind of haven't. So how have they got mm. that product? Have they cloned some other open source technology from others? Are you mindful of some of these that are coming and spending a lot mm. on marketing straight up rather than these others that have been gradually building a community and whatnot? Um, yeah, like the, the main ones I know that play on the whole metaverse spiel is um, Somnium Space, Decentraland, The Sandbox, and CryptoVoxels. And they're all kind of doing the similar things, but in their own niche. I know Somnium is very heavily VR-focused, CryptoVoxels being very Minecraft-focused, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For me, it's a lot about the tokenomics as well. Because, you know, NFTs is, is specific. Like the specific NFT you buy, you have to figure out, well, are they going to mint more of this type? Is your one going to be rare? Is it in a well-located area, etc.? And I know Decentraland has like a cap of 90,000 um, lands, which can only be increased if the whole kind of 
everyone votes that they want an increase, which is probably not going to happen. Yeah. But crypto voxels, they're, they're open. They're going to keep minting more land. I think Somnium Space is going the same way. I know that the Sandbox are still in pre-sale mode and they have another 100,000 lands pegged at 60 bucks to hit the market for the next year. So your lands aren't going to appreciate anytime soon unless you've got at very good locations. Mm. So for me, it's, it's kind of the tokenomics as well. And it's also when to invest. Like the Sandbox looks extremely promising. But I'm not going to invest now, maybe a year down the track once there's more kind of a cap as to the land and where that lies. So I yeah. think, I think you know, they've all been building pretty hard for the last one to two years and, and they all have somewhat of a product out. And I think they're all going to do well. But for me as an investor on where I want to park my money, it's got to do with the tokenomics along with the project. Uh, um, and for those of you that are members, Maddie's going to be doing like a monthly report or something as well. And I think tokenomics would be great to cover because as you say i was maybe looking at investing in the sandbox and i wanted to get them on for uh, a nuggets grill episode before they were going to do that io but they actually brought it forward and did that on binance and i think it listed at a fair like 10 or 20x i think from the sort of pre-sale mm, so i'm all I'm always wary of buying something like 10 or 20x up and I'd mm -hmm. rather I'd rather wait. But um, if that's the case that they're still minting land, it's the same argument about a coin that's scarce versus a coin that's you mm -hmm. know printing far more. So I, I love the fact that there's the tokenomics of the land, but then you've got the more intricate tokenomics of individual swords, um, artwork, mm -hmm. and now we've got some, some artists from the traditional world that are coming in. So... Um, is there anything else I just want to mention for before we jump into some of the artwork and other things? Let's stay on the the uh, virtual land sort of train of thought. A lot of people have seen Decentraland and they say, "Oh, this is crap." You know, I've played a game with real like graphics, and I just want people at home to understand that they've deliberately sort of throttled that back. It's not about mm -hmm. the real world graphics at the moment. It's just about having a rough uh, world design mm -hmm. of where you're going to build a base and, and those types of things, isn't it? Yeah, and I think this comes from like the traditional crypto investing school of thought is like, where's your money going to multiply within a month? And it's that very short term. And I understand it because I, I also have a very short attention span, right? 2017, I was putting my money and pulling it out a week later if it didn't go up more than 50%. <laughs> and I lost a lot of money doing so. So my now thesis is kind of like, who's going there? Who's showing stages of getting there? And if you asked me a year ago in the NFT space, or the broader space, no one would have thought NFTs would have had this much attention. But the same NFTs that people would have put off a year ago are now selling for like 100x their multiple or 50x their multiple. Mm -hmm. So value, I think one thing I failed to do before, which I'm not, I'm making a big effort that I don't do this time, is to see the long-term value in something, to see the momentum and where it's going to be in the next one to two years. So of course, you know, if you go into Decentraland now, it's not going to be the best kind of most graphic intense ready player one. That sort of tech takes a while for the structural components to come together and, and, and output that sort of an experience. Yeah. But who is getting there and who's making those moves? And those kind of answers you'll get when you talk to the community members, when you talk to the leads, when you read the roadmap, when you see them deliver, see what's in play and you see that, where do you still want to be involved in the projects two years down the track? Is this a five-year plan for you? And who do you want to invest your, in your money in? So yeah, it, it really depends investor to investor. Uh, and as you say, the in the Decentraland world, uh, we're about to set up, say, a Nuggets, um, Nuggets News HQ building where people can go in and maybe watch um, our Sunday night video or we'll have our meetups and gatherings there. Um, but there's other people that are making like games within games. So you might go into a building and that'll have like a virtual reality. Now, it, although in the in the virtual world, in that little building, it might be a few meters wide, you can start to create graphics that makes it look like you know you're looking into the distance. The same as when you play a computer game on the screen, and it mm -hmm. creates a a depth perception of 3D graphics. Mm -hmm. So, where this is going to go with all the developers having the tools to build whatever they want within Decentraland, they can build games, uh, little arcade games. You can watch sports matches. We've already had a soccer tournament in Decentraland, as well as just going to a conference. I went to the World Stablecoin Summit. You were there as well the other day, and there's people in the big theater sort of watching the presentation. So um, any other interesting things that have happened since we last spoke in terms of Decentraland? Um, I know that there's going to be flying and there's going to be a voice chat um, implemented. We're working with the mean guys to put like a pineapple head headquarters. There's going to be Maker DAO dropping and like three to four different headquarters dropping. Um, talking with the Outlier Ventures guys. Um, 
uh, Red Fox, uh, multiple people. So we're just trying to decentralize one of those places. The more we integrate ourselves with different communities, the stronger it becomes on a base layer because suddenly this community is interested in having some, some sort of a virtual presence. So I think um, we, we're going to have a lot. I've been tipped that uh, on Halloween is going to be a pretty cool event but there's going to be like staking and earning mana. And as these things kind of integrate with what's hot at the moment, like staking to get NFTs or yield farming, et cetera, and finding some sort of gamification that way. Mm. Um, I know DCL still haven't rolled out their whole proposal funding arm, which is going to be like a few million dollars a year. So once we start to see that being thrown around to people that propose really good experiences, then you should see an acceleration in, in stuff that you see in DCL. Yeah. And again, for people at home, if Red Fox, for example, you saw them, they launched their COGS. If they have a building, um, gamers that like COGS can meet up there on a Friday night and have some sort of virtual drinks together while they're talking and then they play their, their COGS together, um, then they mm -hmm. can win. So Red Fox might say, hey, if you come and play in this event, we'll, you know, we'll give you more. So it's kind of like staking or rewards or airdrops. So all these funky things are going to be happening. I'm sure Funfair will put up a big virtual casino sooner or later because that's one, yeah. thing, one thing I've always been hoping for. Probably. I mean, they've always been seen as the casino token, right? Yeah. But um, so I, I was thinking there's so many things we can do. So there's these funds that want to get involved. Um, Red Fox is probably going to do a lot in kind of accelerating the space and having incubations and and that sort of stuff. And that's stuff like Decentraland can, you know, pull half the money and they can pull half the money and have some, some sort of NFT projects coming out of this space that has a value to both and to mm -hmm. everyone. So I'm seeing Decentraland having the funds to kind of co-incubate um, the NFT space. Yeah. So. I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's maybe get into some of the, the common questions that people get about, well, well, the artwork side of things. Because at the moment on OpenSea, or uh, Rarible and of some of these other marketplaces that are, you can buy and sell these NFTs, people are saying, why are people paying money for this photo or this, mm -hmm. this, this image? I made one, a Nuggets News logo the other day just to test it out and that sold for $400. So what's the argument to why can't someone screenshot that and then it's a copy and why don't they get $400 for it? Yeah, I think there needs to be a separation of the buyer demographic here. There's those that think about it in terms of utility, and they're the screenshot people, and there's those that think about it in terms of collectability. So, of course, you can screenshot it and put it on your wallpaper, mint it again, which I wouldn't recommend because you're stealing someone's piece, but or you could put it on your wall. Um, and those people, they think about it in terms of utility. They have a friend come over, and they look at it and be like, oh, that's cool. But the collectors are the ones that collect Pokemon cards, the ones that collect back scratches, the ones that collect all sorts of insane things just for the sole reason to collect that piece. You know, soccer jerseys that's been signed by a famous soccer player. So these are the ones, I mean, a soccer jersey on, on you know, in Nike store is probably like 150 bucks, but if you get it signed, it's probably a few thousand dollars. So suddenly that attachment that an NFT can create with the original artist um, and that artist has a history or has been in the space for two years, has a following of 15 to 20,000, sometimes 100,000 followers on Instagram. Mm. Um, if you attach yourself to the official NFT that they've released and it can be tracked and verified on blockchain, that's the one that has value. And of course, you can, again, take a screenshot and sell it on Rarible. You probably make a few bucks because people might think you're legit, but you're not. You're kind of, kind of, you're kind of faking the market or, mm. or doing what you know, thieves do in the marketplaces, you know, copying Nike and stuff. But the demographic that is paying the big bucks, they're the collectors. And as long as that demographic cares and grows, then that price will continue to grow. So it's a little bit like their responsibility is is kind of on the buyer as well. If you mm -hmm. went down to the the Melbourne market and someone was trying to sell Michael Jordan signed Nike shoes, you'd kind of be asking, well, hold on, you know, where's Michael Jordan? And it's the same when you go to these art shops. If there's a famous artist that you want to buy a piece from, you'd look for them to be selling it. You wouldn't just look for some random who's trying to make a few bucks to copy it. So there's there's going to be knockoffs, but there's going to be ways to police that because all the everything in Ethereum is going to start to build digital identity, trust, and reputation. So these are all problems that are, are being solved. Mm -hmm. And um, is the rareable marketplaces, or is it super rare, are they the ones that only have like one of one pieces? Is that right? Yeah, so super rare is famous, and I think it's the only platform currently where if you mint anything, it's only a one of one edition. Mm, yeah. Okay. And I, um, yeah, yeah. 
I was playing around with that the other night and I couldn't get a few of those things to show up and I think it's because they were like 10 of or 3 of so it's only super rares only have one of one pieces mm -hmm. which is which is cool as well so yeah a really interesting graph um sorry Alex to cut you off but a really interesting graph is over the last 2 years um I never really paid attention to super rare or the art market for me it was just bonkers why would people be collecting these art pieces where there's literally unlimited supply from an investor point it didn't make sense right but when it started to click and they started to stay there for the last six to seven months on a top trending volume by volume project, I started to pay attention. And now if you look at the graph that they have where every day of the last two years, it shows the average value that each piece is going for. It started off as 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 Ethereum. And now it's about 2, 2.5 Ethereum, um, the average art piece goes for. So you can see that gradual I might, trend. I might upwards. bring it up while you're, um, while you're talking there, Maddie. But yeah, um, so super rare. Someone gave me one of these for my birthday. Jeff from Caleb and Brown. So thank you. He gave me one for my birthday. And this was when it was very early on, the tech. So even if I knew how to use MetaMask and that, it was still really hard to um, get my head around. So I might share my screen with you so you can see what I'm doing as well. But uh, uh, is it in market? And oh, the, the graph? Is that what you wanted? Yeah, I was just going to show people what you were talking about. Sorry, man. It's in um, OpenSea. So you'll have to open OpenSea. It's a graph by them. Oh, okay. I thought I saw it on the Super Rare website, but let's go over to OpenSea as well. Yeah. Uh, and so what I want people at home to understand as well is that anything that's in your MetaMask address and your wallet mm -hmm. will start to show up in these places automatically as well. Browse. So uh, browse. The Browse tab, yeah? Yeah. And then find Super Rare. Yeah. Uh Got it. Sorry, man. Uh, sorry, uh, Alex. I think you should click rankings and then find super rare. So oh, on the yeah, top on right. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then find super rare number five. And you should see a graph there pop populate. Yep. There we go. Fantastic. So this is all time back to 2019 there when average price was, yeah, half. And now we're up towards, wow. Okay. Three. Three Ethereum for the average piece and 350 sold. That's that's amazing. Mm. So, but yeah, like I was saying it before, if you've got your MetaMask address, guys, you can create a new address for each thing. So you can have an address for Decentraland, an address for Super Rare, and I'd encourage you to do that. But whatever you've got in these addresses, when you go to, say, OpenSea or the Super Rare Marketplace, um, it'll sort of bring it up. And this is where I want people to understand the concept of what Web3 is. When you go to buy something in Decentraland, it's not like get out your credit card on eBay and type in these things. Everything is embedded in that Ethereum wallet or your address, or you can connect your ledger and do it through MetaMask. So this is this world where everything you own digitally and financially, it's all sort of embedded and you interact with the app and that's all on top of the blockchain. Exactly, exactly. Right. So um, moving on, I think other things that people have had a hard time to understand, I guess, are why people would uh, uh, invest in land. So you mentioned already that mm -hmm. there's a set number in Decentraland. Mm -hmm. They're going for similar prices as what they were a couple of years ago, which I find is interesting that they haven't gone up a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there like Crypto Valley, for example, that region that's all crypto themed, is that a big premium over somewhere that's another... Is there other themes um, in there? Yeah. Yeah, there's a few other themes. I mean, you've got the casinos on the top left in Vegas that are slowly starting to come online now with thematic integration. So that'll, you know, people can do whatever they want there pretty quickly and seamlessly. We have all the art HQs dropped near Voltaire districts and any galleries that want to open up. You know, it's pretty premium to get land around that area. Crypto Valley with all the HQ drops is kind of becoming like the business center. So the land around there is appreciating a lot. I know a lot of people that came in trying to find land they were happy to pay thirty to 50,000 mana a piece there, but not in the far outskirts where it's still only 8,000 mana. So with digital land, I think specifically with Decentraland, um, it's utility driven. People don't really buy it for a collector, collector value. And for a long time, we were all about, all right, well, it looks like the land around roads are appreciating, lands connected to Genesis plazas are appreciating. But now what we're seeing, especially in the last three to six months, as contents becoming as contents being deployed is that people want to get land near these projects that they think might have a lot of um, attention to them or they might hold regular meetups or they'll get juice some of that traffic juice so that's happened a lot in crypto valley and and now as as projects kind of set up their areas or certain niches start to become 
famous, then I think the areas around those will appreciate. And it depends on what you want to do as well, doesn't it? So if you maybe you want to set up next to a casino, um, if you've got something that you think is related to that casino, if you're in Crypto Valley, you probably want to be a crypto business and, and you know art investors might want to go near the art. So it's all relative, just like the real world. Is it is it um, correct that the tokenomics is that uh, the mana that's used to buy land is all burnt? Is that right? So in the primary auctions where when we first, when land wasn't owned by anyone and the only way to get it was to bid against someone else, all the mana that was spent on that was burnt. Hmm. But now on the secondary marketplace, obviously people want the money from making the sale. So a percentage gets burnt, like 2.5%. But there has been an interest in um, speaking to August and the team and the DAO and people among the community is to how do we kind of spread that value? So these fees that are being burned, why don't we just distribute it to landowners? Why don't we distribute it to manor owners? So suddenly that value is being circulated throughout the platform and people that have land can build more stuff. Um, manor still continues to increase because um, it's being distributed and more people want to hold on to it because they get incentivized by the, you know, we got 22 million manor per year vested. That's going to go to the community in some way or the other. So why don't, excellent, why, does, why doesn't like a portion of it just go to the landowners? So we're seeing these tokenomics play a more kind of deeper role with DeFi coming out and there's been this movement towards how do we get, how, do, how does everyone kind of get paid basically? So I think that part of it's going to be very interesting moving forward. Have all the primary <laughs> lands sold? You can only buy off secondary market. So who, who bought them all up dirt cheap? Oh, well, in the first auction, like 60% of them sold and a lot of them sold for like a thousand mana. This was in like... Just whales and... Yeah. Oh, no, no. There's a pretty big spread of people. I mean, I don't know how many wallets, you know, participate in the first auction, but probably like 600 to 1,000 spread of um, investors. And there were some whales, but even the largest whale looks like a guppy when you look at the whole map and who owns what and the color distribution. Okay. So That's it's, not, it's not like owned by... not not. There's no majority stake by anyone. Awesome. Uh, to me, when you're sort of describing that as well, it's coming back to the macro world and you think about taxes. Can you imagine if there was like a, a crypto project or a DAO that said every time you sell something, you know, we're going to take 40% tax like we do in Australia for the wealthy people or even 25% on whatever it is in other countries. Whereas you're going towards this model where it's like, how can we reward the users and give them back mm. value because they're going to spend and circulate and, and grow the digital economy. And it's literally what I think we're heading towards in the real world that we've got to try and get money into the hands of more people and even mm -hmm. the lower income earners because they're going to spend it on other stuff and get the economy circulating. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's a bit of a tangent, but I find it interesting. Yeah, man, totally. I, I see Decentraland from the governance and the community incentivization model to be a complete big experiment. Like for me, it's just like I could sit back with no holdings whatsoever and I'd be interested just to see what happens <laughs> over time. And a lot of um, DeFi projects have made that move to go towards a DAO where they're run by the community rather than the team. Mm -hmm. Decentraland is definitely wanting to go down that path, aren't they, of the... Everyone that has a say gets to vote on, well, do we change this? Do we change that? Yeah. It's, it's going down that path. Yeah. yeah. So it is definitely going that part, down that part. And I and I had a conversation with some of the, I guess, leaders in the DeFi space. I had Cooper and, and a couple of others, Daryl Lau and um, uh, a couple of others. Yeah. And I was like, let's talk about governance. And it was interesting because across the board, they had the same issues that we were facing in Decentraland where the biggest mana, the biggest token holders get the biggest say, right? And I think where this is where NFTs are going to play a role, where Decentraland made it so that if you own land now, you also have 2,500 mana worth of weight in voting. And with NFTs, you can do a lot more. Suddenly, if you're a citizen or if you're classified as citizen of Decentraland because maybe you spent X hours in, in the platform or something, you can get an NFT. Maybe if you win a contest, maybe if you, you know, there's multiple things that we can give value to through this token and then give it this weight, this vote power to vote. Um, I think with NFTs, you can distribute that fairness along a bit better. So, Yeah, there's a. am not sure what type of ERC token it is, but the proof of um, attendance protocol. Have you... I think it's an ERC721. Okay, so that's an yeah. NFT style token. And mm -hmm. where we can go with that concept is that if someone's been attending a lot of events in Decentraland and they've kind of become part of the community, you can say, well, hey, here's this proof of attendance token from all the things that they've done. 
And maybe they should have way more of a vote than some whale that bought all this land and is just trying to game the system to do whatever is best for them. And that's mm-hmm. what we've kind of seen with something like Uniswap experimenting by dropping those tokens to people that have been big users of their protocol. And we're going to start mm-hmm. to see a lot of that happen where they are building mechanisms to reward the actual users. And again, this is just such an experiment for real life. Yeah, I think, and this is one of the reasons why I made an acquisition with Axie Infinity is because they're they're a really smart dev team. They've always focused on incentivizing their users in I might bring that up ways. as well, Matty, while you're talking. Yeah, so they've got this special class of axes called Mystic Axes. And Mystic Axes could have only been bought, if you were lucky, two and a half years ago during the original pre-sale. You had a chance of your Mystic of your Axie being a Mystic or having one Mystic part or two Mystic parts, etc. So I think what they're going to do is I think they're going to distribute tokens to their community and people that have Mystic Axes are, get, are going to get rewarded more. So that's why I kind of went crazy and bought like 12 Mystic Axes because I think, you know, people that hold Mystics, they're more, they're putting more money, they're kind of long-term holders, they're investing in the project. So that'll be an interesting drop to watch. I might. Um, sorry, I'll share my screen with you again, and you can um, you can tell us what to check out because this is one that I've only had a quick look at, and they had a token, the special special love potions, and that wasn't yeah. really the sort of token that I, I saw as a, something you invest in. So Market, now people are buying yeah. axes. Um. Hmm. Marketplace. Uh. Yep. Click marketplace. And now you see on the bottom left, it says Mystic, and there's like a counter there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. To, to put that to one. Oh. So your Axie could have one Mystic, two Mystic parts, three Mystic parts. Each Axie has six parts. Um, so if you go to the lowest price, you can see the bottom floor is 4.4 Ethereum at the moment. Um, two, three weeks ago, this was like 1.5 Ethereum. Okay. And what's the mystic, like what are the different qualities and what does that mystic describe? Yeah, so if that specific, so if you click on that axis, so if you click on any of those axes, yeah. and you you see how at the bottom it says body parts and it shows that one of them has a mystic label yep. on it. Yeah. So I think that can evolve. In, so you can kind of um, evolve that part into, you know, second uh, legendary, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So the way these are played, if you scroll down, a little bit. Um, you see these cards, they're generated based on what parts the Axie has. So depending on what parts the Axie has and the class, etc., you will get four cards that can be played with the Axie. And so in a strategy game where it's three versus three and each Axie gets a set of cards, you know, depending on who you have, which parts it has, etc., they'll have, you know, a stronger, uh, a more strategy kind of value. Yeah, I can. But but the mystics are really just collectible. Some of the mystic um, axes, they're not strong at all, but the fact is that they've got that mystic tag and there's only, as you saw, only 160 available for purchase. Yep. Whereas if you take off that mystic filter, you'll see like 150,000 uh, 150, axes available for purchase. Okay, interesting again. Um, have you spent a lot of time playing others like Gods Unchained or any other NFTs that you're really liking? Yeah, so I'm big on, I was big on Gods Unchained. I'm big on any project that is well-funded and has a team that can back it up, right? The worst thing that I've seen over the last two years is a great idea, looks very pretty on paper and a landing page, um, but within a year they run out of funding because they've only got a couple hundred thousand dollars behind them. Mm. Um, so Axie Infinity is one of those that are well-funded. Gods Unchained are also quite well-funded, but the problem the problem they have at the moment is that gas fees have totally killed the market, where before you could buy these $2 cards for $0.10, cents, that was their gas fees were $0.10, cents, right? So there was a healthy market for these $2 cards, $5 cards. Now it's $15 sometimes to buy a $5 card. So that's why it's doing very minimal uh, volume, but I know that they're transitioning into their own um, chain immutable X, which is going to be hopefully a lot faster and way, way cheaper. So once that's rolled out, I have, I'm pretty confident those cards will go up in value. So I have a pretty big stack of my gods unchained cards. Yeah. So they're using um, ZK snark technology. So just like we've spoken about on the channel guys, whether it's um, Zcash, that's a privacy coin that uses that or Ethereum and some of those second layer technologies like baseline and the uh, enterprise, uh, protocols that are now using those 
because they provide privacy, but they also scale. Now we're seeing some gaming projects using that technology to, to basically scale up for the gas fees. And so all the best DeFi projects, all the best um, NFT and gaming projects are going to be using these scaling technologies to overcome this problem because we can't be paying $15 for a $2 card. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Matty, what else has been happening? Um, what, are the, like, what are the things that I haven't even discovered yet? What's, what's really exciting you? Um, man, so much has been happening just in the traditional space. Like certain artists are getting involved. And I think it's been really beautiful to see artists getting involved to get paid and using blockchain and cryptocurrency and the technology that we've known in our heart of hearts for the last 10 to 12 years has value and is at some stage going to go mainstream. And I think we're on the cusp of that realization mm. as artists are getting involved just to put their music on there because there's a way to kind of put value to the stuff they're doing in the digital realm. Mm. So I'm seeing a lot of artists, um, new artists that have nothing to do with crypto. They have no history of selling crypto art, but their main art that they have, they're putting it on chain, are selling them as NFTs and they're making way more than they are selling selling um, yeah. traditional art. Yeah. And I, I had a guy who I brokered a deal with who um, said, sorry, man, I can't sell you any original pieces because it's part of a gallery deal. And then I said, all right, well, what if I get you approved um, super? I'll guide you through the process. I'll show you what, um, you know, how you can get approved through these platforms. And the first five NFTs that you sell, you'll sell it to me and for this much. And it was blown away to the price that I offered. But I know in the NFT world, it's valued at that or a lot more. So I think it's going to be this slow realization that, you know, things are just move so much faster in the crypto world. Mm. So the, I have reached out to that young guy, and I'm not sure if this is the same guy, the Fuocious or whatever his name is. And um, this is a different person, but Fuocious is also someone that I reached out to before the whole exponential thing. Yeah. So I basically he was a young kid, 17, and he put up some artwork, and someone paid a lot of money for it, and he was blown away. But then I also saw some people sort of like trolling him. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was Bitcoin Maxis, and I was thinking, you know, you're giving a 17 year old kid a hard time about NFTs, yeah. and he's an artist. And so I reached out to him, and I gave him one of those Nuggets News ones that I made the other day, and just sort of welcomed him to the crypto space. And, nice. and he was like, oh, so how do you do this on the second layer on the X die thing? And sort of, I sort of taught him that as well. So it's the blending nice. of these these two worlds. And for someone like him, you could just tell that his mind was like, you know, there's no artists, there's no businesses, there's no contract, there's no art galleries. It's just create something, put it up there with a click and sell it and make money. Like awesome. how, how cool is that? It's awesome. He's actually a really smart kid. Um, not just does art, but he had a store up selling ferocious prints and all this kind of stuff for a while now. And, yeah. you know, those are the type of, as, an art, as a collector, you want to invest in a journey like that, where he's so serious about art, exploring the tech and what it can do to him. And also the fact that there's so many artists that respect that person, right? And um, I, I think, like, as, they, as the tech develops as well, like, we'll see a lot more artists. Isn't like... What I've noticed is regardless of the gas fees, even if they're $10, $15, $30, art continues to sell. Mm. It's the only thing that I've seen in the whole space that doesn't take a, doesn't slow down at all. It's nah. just whatever the hurdles are, people will buy art. So that's why I'm bullish on it the most. Yeah, and I think it's a little bit like coin supply. For example, if, if I had sold that NFT and got excited because I got some money, if I trade 100 tomorrow and dilute my sort of mm -hmm. rarity and scarcity, they're not going to all sell. And it's the same with this art. And uh, you mentioned yep. music. So I really like the fact that music and ownership and that disruption of the big record companies and the labels, it's the same for game creation and, and all that. It's getting rid of all the the guys that have the keys and silo everything and have the power and giving it back to the user and I think that's going to result in way more creativity. Um, so we'll dive into all that in future episodes. But um, I think we've been running nearly an hour. So look, Whoa. guys, Matty is going to be doing, well, he's already doing daily updates on his Twitter. Um, in the group, he's very active for members. And we're going to start doing that monthly NFT report with some projects and tokenomics and stuff. So look, I'm not sure what we're going to do together, but I'm just so excited about this space. I think it is definitely going to be the next big thing. Hopefully... If we haven't convinced everyone, we'll continue to, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, go through all your concerns and um, pushbacks because that's what we always want to do, have a healthy conversation. But Maddie, any final thoughts? And um, I'll put the links to follow your stuff down below. Final thoughts is uh, nothing really. Like it's, there's just so much happening. You know, um, 
if you guys are paying attention, you're doing a lot for yourselves. You don't have to like throw in some money. It's not like cryptocurrencies where you're going to miss the boat if you don't get into a low cap coin. It's one of those spaces where you just take the time to understand what's going on. It's going to be multiple NFT projects that come out. So take your time, connect yourself with Alex, connect yourself with me and anyone else that provides that knowledge and just absorb it all. It's a great, great spot. Fantastic. Well, guys, um, leave any questions and comments you've got down below uh, for the next episode. Um, and yeah, make sure you're following Maddie, and we'll talk to you again next month. So I hope you've enjoyed that one and cheers. See you, Maddie.